This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Jim Dahl, episode number 108. We're scattered all over the place, the uh, three of us. That would be me, Tim, and Simon. We're on all corners of the planet now. Yes, uh, I guess uh, for the uninformed listener, Lydia is now in San Francisco. Simon's in Los Angeles, and I'm in home of J.S. Bach, Leipzig, Germany at 2 a.m. Nice. Yeah. Well, we're all in different climates and different times. Well, Simon and I are on the same time zone. Simon and I had a rather wonderful time in Los Angeles this past week. Sounds like it. We did. On my show with Sylvia Black, Adele Verte, and Lisa of the Bell Rays, all former guests of our show. That went down a blast. Um, okay. How was the uh, movie premiere? Same as or always. L- LA movie premiere. Right? Yeah. Fantastic. The, you guys look like California mode. You're all like Lydia's look reclining on something. And uh, Simon's got some kind of like dumb South- Southern California grin on his face. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. But uh, all right. I don't so know how, how I don't know how my reclining in somebody's bed at this hour before I do a, breath, a minor DJ set, meaning that I'm going to instruct Paul Kasturis, what to play while I ah. bounce around flirting uh, before cool. my big show tomorrow night with Eugene Robinson. And uh, that sounds, sounds pretty good. And I it's will just- be tomorrow in Halle and I'll be Saturday in Berlin. Uh, if people are interested, I'm doing some solo and collaboration shows, which I'm very much looking forward to. It's an international affair this episode, I must say, I must say. Yes, it's all been rather grand. It's all been rather grand. And it's it's great because connecting not only with past guests of the show, but future guests of the show. Future guests. I mean, are you are you reading into reading into people that I don't even know about or ones we've recorded that are about to pop up? I was happy to meet a future guest, Tyler Hubby. And what's interesting about him is he went to school with Bob Calhoun, who was on last week. Don, okay. John Tottenham dated his sister-in-law. What? And, <laughs> and he's still friends with the professor that brought me in to teach at the San Francisco Art Institute decades ago. I mean, the connective tissue with <laughs> Tyler Hubby. And by the way, I only heard of Tyler Hubby uh, worked on the Daniel Johnston documentary. Okay. And I was contacted about him about a month ago for a show that you and I might do together, Tim, in October, where they're going to play Tyler Hubby's Tony Conrad uh, film. And where would that be? That would be in Providence. Oh, okay. Okay. So, cool. I mean, Tony Conrad, who was like one of the- No, I know who Tony is. Members, sure. Well, we're going to know more when we have Tyler on, but how about <laughs> Tyler, who he claims I met him once with Jack Sargent years ago, another- possible future the connective to tissue is blowing my mind tonight it's it's next level connective tissue i have I'd like to, to say blow, i'd like to blow my nose because when i got to paul's house in san francisco we both immediately <laughs> put a home covid test and our clean ah. you have home well, covid tests now well speaking of blowing well blowing loads i should say men who ejaculate harvard study at least 20 times a month 21 times a month very specific slash the risk of prostate cancer by a third right. as opposed to people that do it less not opposed to people who do like a hundred times a month so people who, who ejaculate um are men between 20 and 50 specifically that's what the study was done on it, it was a lot of people too um but uh people who kind of guys who come like five times a month it, it, their chances of prostate cancer are significantly higher and, and by the way I guess people talk about boobs more and guys are kind of embarrassed when that shit gets f- fucked up. Prostate cancer is actually more common than breast cancer. Not that it, it's not that it's a Olympics of who's suffering more here, but uh, it's kind of one of these silent killers. So guys go out there and blow loads. If you don't want to, well, if you want to reduce the risk of getting this ter- terrible thing. I-, I heard about a study where women who ejaculate at least, well, once in their lifetime, I'm saying more or less <laughs> orgasm to be kind. At least once a week, there's a far less chance that they're going to commit homicide. Just saying. Now, well, now we're that, talking. <laughs> I don't know if you heard about this, but I have to say this did get my panties in an uproar. This happened in New York. 
Suspect shorts pulled down during a botched New York City robbery. No, <laughs> that's embarrassing. So it's, so it's like some vaudevillian physical comedy in the midst of a hey, botched hey, robbery. A would be thief was caught on video with his pants down after he knocked down a man on Brooklyn Street in an attempted robbery. The NYPD said it happened around 2 40 in the afternoon, which is even more embarrassing. An unidentified man knocks a 25-year-old man to the ground near the corner of 54th Street and 7th Avenue in Sunset Park, not far from where I abide. And the attacker began to punch the victim while attempting to steal his cash. Well, wise enough, the would-be victim yanked, <laughs> cranky, yanked yeah. his horse down. And that was pretty <laughs> much the end of that. So... What can you, what can I well, say? Uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, criminals out there that wear those baggy, baggy pants or track pants. And I think this is a good ploy to know is somebody tries to attack you and they're wearing track pants, just pull those bad boys down and, and let them trip over their own fucking shorts. Well, Lydia, I mean, one of your biggest fans of all times, I'm not going to throw him under the bus, but we are doing a show in, Toronto and he wanted exclusive access to uh, photographs of our show and he was kind of hanging on the edge of the stage as on, <laughs> uh, on like a light fixture and he was smiling looking at the audience like as if he was kind of maybe part of the experience and it was summer and someone just came <laughs> and yanked his shorts down and I think he had a I think I think he had a Prince Albert and he was like holding over dear dear life. So he's like he was spinning around and rotating. So like the whole audience got like a, a whole kind of audience got a perspective. And you know, we're playing loud rock and roll. So I'm just there. You can't hear the laughters, but I'm looking at this thick audience and I just see like <laughs> a ton of mouths just open wide, burst out laughing as we're rocking out. And then, and then, you know, he kind of gets his composure, people are moving forward. It happens a second time. Well, you know, if you make an ass of yourself, (laughs) you can't expect others to just sit by idly. Something's going to happen. Now, I mean, speak about buffoonery. Coffin pops open after Uh New York City cemetery workers try to force casket into okay. a grave and there is a lawsuit pending horrified mourners watch as workers at a brooklyn cemetery tried to force a coffin into a grave that was dug too small that's, why, <laughs> that's how i felt the last time i was having sex it's like oh, oh my god the coffin about carried, incompetent. i'm telling you the coffin carrying the remains of 79 year old clarabelle oppenheimer got stuck in the grave and popped open as workers struggled to shake it free during the somber burial turned tragic farce on June 24th at the Evergreen <laughs> Cemetery, according to the lawsuit. When family and friends looked inside the damaged coffin, Oppenheimer's hands were no oh, longer boy. folded as they had been in the funeral home because of mm. rough handling. Oh, well, boy. I believe that the cemetery is in the business of burying people. And I think the most basic thing they do every day is dig holes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. said. How something like this happens is beyond me. Well, look, it happens in New York because there's a lot of people just not doing their job as accurately as they go. Fortunately, there were only 35 mourners in it, you know, but so nobody was happy. The sound of the coffin scraping the sides of the hole Fill the air, <laughs> according to the law. Oh, good. And workers pushed, lifted, lowered the coffin over and over again, trying to get it into. The- Why didn't they just dump her out? I don't understand. I'm just saying. The- pulling and tugging. I really dig that story. Uh, they kept uh, pulling it- and tugging. <laughs> Sounds like something I've seen you do before. <laughs> really? I mean, that's dur- just during doing our- it for a testing- hell. Well, I was testing out the, the Harvard study. I didn't really believe it was true. So but go ahead. Good for you. It yeah. took an hour. It took an like hour. Like me, like me, like me, like me. <laughs> it was horrific. Like you can be at times. Like and, me, like me. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I, right, well, I, have a, I, have a, I have a corpse story, too. So hold on. So dig it out. Two, two well, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> Two Texas uh, teenagers, they got busted. Well, they put it on Snapchat. They 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 stole jewelry from a corpse. Uh, they were they were walking. I don't know where this was in probably some city, but they were like, "What the fuck's that?" And there was a corpse in one of these uh, city street jan- jan- drains. 
And they, they went over there and then they started checking wait out the guy. Wait, wait, Tim, back up. There was a corpse in a drain. Yes. yes. It was like a homeless guy. I mean, it probably wasn't a homeless guy because they had all this jewelry. But uh, there was a corpse in a drain. And these two teenagers, these two uh, young women, 16 and 17, they're like, what the fuck's that? I think they were dumb as shit. But uh, they, they, they basically like, they grabbed the medallion. And one of them was like, this, this matches my style. And they put it on Snapchat. And uh, of course, uh, now they're both they're both arrested. <laughs> People weren't such ham bones. They could get away with these stupid petty crimes. But speaking <laughs> about petty crimes and not so petty crimes, mm-hmm. Ghislaine Maxwell, that chronic complainer about her. No, yes. Griffin, which, you know, I'm sure it's not the best of times for her. Living in Sunset Park in Brooklyn right now in jail. Yes. Well, well, the warden at Ghislaine's facility was just accused of murdering her own husband. So a federal prison warden who oversaw the care of notable <laughs> criminals, not only just Lane, but others we don't know that much about, have been accused of killing her husband. Around 2.15 a.m. on August 2nd, police in Jackson Township, New Jersey, responded to a 911 call for a report of a man who was shot. Officers arrived on the scene and found Roderick Ashford, 47, unresponsive on the floor with a gunshot wound to the face. G- Just Lane's got one of the most dynamic lives of almost anyone considering mur- it's, it's, it's like dynasty or like murder and powerful people. And, you know, dynasty is full of like you know, pedophile sex slaves, that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, this is only a peripheral <laughs> crime to her life, but investigators determined that the wife, Antonia Ashford, shot the victim, according to the t- attorney's office, and she was arrested and taken to Ocean County Jail facing charges of murder, of course, possession of a weapon. But Antonia is the associate warden at the Federal Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, which is where Ghislaine is home. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, there's also members of, you know, that latest sex cult, Mac and Keith Rainier, home to, I mean, all kinds of people waiting for, you know, charges of sex, uh, child sex abuse. Former Donald Trump's lawyer, Michael Cohen, was serving a three year sentence at the facility till he was released. Things aren't going too good there at all. El Chapo's in the same building as Ghislaine. I, but is El Chapo there now? What's where is well, that guy now? In this article, they show a picture of Ghislaine with a black eye, but she refuses to say how it happened. It's, a, it's not a very big building. I, it's, it's near Sam Osmond's studio. And I've driven by it many times. It's uh, it's kind of like for all the, well, that bar we went to with that, that weird one with a pool hall bar. Uh, it's, it's right around the corner from there, Lydia. That, that, uh, First Avenue near the, near the water in, in Brooklyn. All right, well, Anyhow, carry, all carrying right. on and more crimes, uh, tr- yes. more idiotic crimes committed by stupid people. A MAGA lawyer repping January 6th rioters plans to try an unusual defense, but there is one big problem. A highly leveraged attorney whose reputation is in tatters already has become the go-to defense for January 6th rioters. John Pierce, whose boutique law firm is facing mountains of debt, has represented that other, that that Kenosha, Wisconsin murder suspect, Kyle Rittenhouse. Oh, that and former shit. Trump campaign aide Carter Page, and now more than a dozen U.S. Capitol rioters as he plans to use an unusual tactic to defend the insurrectionists, reported. We're going to take every one of these cases to trial. We're going to seek full acquittals, and in the process, we're going to find out what actually happened on January 6th, Pierce, and the idiot lawyer said. Pierce said in one court hearing that he would pursue a public authority defense. A tactic sometimes used by informants to argue that his 17 clients believe the government, in this case, the ass clown former president, had legally yeah. sanctioned their crimes. But some legal observers believe that strategy, of course, is destined to fail. First of all, the lawyer is not a defense attorney. Therefore, he's not really a good defense attorney, right. which is what it would take in order to make a good public authority defense. So that's why nobody else is trying this defense. Anyway, Pierce was fired by Rittenhouse over a financial dispute. Oh, my God. He represented Proud Boy William Pep, conservative media, a conservative media, Leon L. Brent Boswell IV, and another alleged Proud Boy. So he's got all the losers 
in his tank. And his law firm, right before getting involved in this case, dissolved under more than 800000 in tax debt and his own admitted <laughs> substance <laughs> abuse issues. Oh, and yeah, he reportedly course. sent his ex-wife menacing messages and threatened to kill her. This is the guy. <laughs> who's oh, that seems consistent. This is the guy defending the idiotic January 6th so-called yeah. Trumper insurrectionist. Uh, you That's know what? I'm it. glad they know not of my crimes is all I can say. Well, I'm going to talk about more dumb things. Do you know about Pigeon Forge? It's this... Uh, kind of museum slash interactive theme park in Tennessee. Well, they have, yeah, they have like, I think over 4,000 artifacts of the original Titanic there. It's basically the number one Titanic museum. Why the hell there? Uh, well, it's, it's why the hell is London Bridge, the real London Bridge in Arizona? <laughs> and I mean, come on. So they had this all kind of interactive, all kind of experiential, where they basically had this kind of fake Titanic and they had this, uh, iceberg replica well of course the iceberg totally collapses and just hospitalizes a bunch of fucking people i would say actually pigeon forge is more realistic than the fucking crappy movie i mean <laughs> you can actually really experience some really terror in that thing that movie sucks shit i agree and one thing about you know and i'm gonna I have to make a little comment of that fucking movie because I, I saw it once and, and i remember I saw it when it came out. I was in the theater. I remember just kind of hating it instantly. And I was talking this loud the whole time just as my expression of that. And all these people were like, shh, and covering their ears and just calling it out all the historical flaws in it. But, but besides the historical flaws, for people have seen it. So the Kate Winslet woman, I guess at the end, she's like this elderly woman where she has that precious jewel that she drops in the water. And, and then they imply she goes to heaven and in, in, in heaven, um, all right, she, all right, tie hold, it up. On, hold on, hold on, hold on, Jesus, hold on. There's a she, point, I hope. There is a point. She in heaven is where she finally meets Leonardo, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio. I can't even say it right now. Yeah, I'd yeah, rather exactly. go to heaven and meet Leopold von Sacher. Oh, 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 but this is where this is where it's, this is where it's fucked up because this character is listed like a hundred and she has a whole husband and a family and all these kids. So when she finally dies, she like abandons everything about that and, and just hooks up with, with DiCaprio, who she had an affair with over three days during okay, the Titanic. Right, I'm like, she's a bad person. She's I can't stand person. DiCaprio, but I, I <laughs> look in this life, I can do whatever I want. And in that case, I'm going to say, tie it up <laughs> I hated that fucking story. I don't like the movie. I didn't see it. I don't like to get ahead, real as an actor. I don't like any movie that costs as much to make as it would to finance an entire city for a week. In this case, let's get <laughs> on to more serious subject matter. I I have another real serious one. Well, I don't yours, really. So. I'm not sure. I even. I'm not sure. I even want to hear it. Go ahead. Try me. Well, Samantha Rand Ramdell is now in the Guinness Book of the World, World Records. She technically has the biggest mouth. And I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> on the planet, which measures well, not, the most, <laughs> not the most action, not the most action mouth. That would be a cross between me or you. <laughs> sure, but but she it's it's a five and a half inches wide, two point five six inches long. I don't know what long necessarily means because I know some people can get much more. I, if that's depth, I mean anyhow. But um, she's also become an internet sensation, and and, and I think what? I don't know if people are making. Well, Why do people are making people are perverts or they're making fun of her, but they're like, you know, jam a whole big, big Mac in your mouth in one bite. And she's like, okay. And she does it. Um, Impressive. So, uh, now you're talking. Yeah. Yeah. So she basically people, she has a record now. And then basically her fans kind of contact her and they want her to simulcast her just jamming giant things in her mouth. <laughs> so that's my important story of the week. Well, you know, whatever <laughs> turns you on. Tim, whatever. Well, I mean, that, that, that doesn't turn me on, but I. All right. Well, look, I, I mean, you know what? I, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just calling it a day right now because. Please do. I'm going to speak about an intelligent creature who's their next guest, Ooh. who has a ah. rather sexy mouth and actually Ooh. intelligent lyrics come out of it. And that would be the magnificent Shirley Manson. Oh, I mean, I can guess. Where were Today. you? I mean, I know. I mean, I knew we were going to do it. I, mean, I didn't hear that she's okay. All right, we but don't need. Ahead. We don't need to hear that you didn't know that. Okay, I take it back. 
We're going to cut this ridiculous intro right. <laughs> by by editing into a rather provocative and enjoyable conversation with garbage front woman Shirley Manson, my number one female crush. And uh, that's all I know for now, because we're all scattered all over different parts of the planet soon to come together again. Uh, yes, we are. All. You will be my escort to an event in New Haven. We've done this before. I can't wait. Oh, and yes. until then, I guess I'll just see you next week, wherever you are. And uh, I'll be back near Sunset Park, close enough to pull somebody's pants down if needed, or to go mm-hmm. visit uh, Jis Lane to maybe put the final nail in her coffin, which, trust me, <laughs> if I gave her a coffin, it would go deeper than six feet under. <laughs> in the meantime, this has been the Lydian Spin, and it is the Lydian Spin, and uh, Simon Slater, it was great to uh, have a little staycation in L.A. with you, and uh, Tim Dahl, look forward to our next Zoomathon. Lo- likewise. Good night. <laughs> This is the Lydia Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and my number one crush, Shirley Manson. Hello, Lydia Lunch. Hello. This feels like this feels like a rock and roll fantasy for me. Just so you know, <laughs> that I get to speak with you like this. It's mental. Honey, if you could see what I wasn't wearing below, it would not be a fantasy. <laughs> Fair enough, Lydia. Fair it, enough. Let's it, keep it. It would be a pantless. Private. A pantless see. I'm man spread and I got nothing below. Well, you'd know how I roll. By the way, <laughs> looking good, <laughs> sister. Today, I don't know why I kept thinking about you, of course, for the podcast and doing my research, but I also kept thinking about Shirley Jackson, the writer. Do you, do you know, uh, we have always wow. lived in the castle, the haunting of Hill House. Every time I was thinking your name in my head, Shirley Jackson was trying to get a word in. Well, tell Shirley Jackson to F off. Hey, she's Roar. dead already. She's dead already. <laughs> and we're more, we're more than alive. Hey, congratulations on the seventh LP. <laughs> <laughs> That's my joke. Thank you. Um, it's a good thing we don't share. Oh my God, imagine if we both shared. No, that's okay. We can use each other's, but we can't share one. Um, No gods, no masters. In this case, no bras, no panties. But um, (laughs) that's going to be the name of our our collaboration. I doubt it. That's a good one. I like it. Have either of you uh, met in the flesh yet? I feel like she's sitting on my lap right now. Okay, all right. My high school drummer bandmate is Eric Gardner, who subbed for butch oh my god I, I don't know why though it's oh. it still feels i mean i guess because i interviewed Cheryl, she was gracious enough to be interviewed for my documentary on artist depression anxiety and rage and i just immediately felt like we've always known each other yeah i felt the same way it's really really amazing but big shout out to eric gardner who's a an incredible drummer and uh, a beautiful person yeah, and an amazing artist. Is he going on this tour with you, this upcoming tour? Not that I know of. I believe Butch Fig is supposed to be filling in uh, his <laughs> filling in his, his usual his, position. <laughs> right. His usual position, assuming normal position A. Let's talk about the non-normality of this new recording. I went back and listened to the last, you know, official album, which I don't know if this is misnomed in, a, in an interview that you said was kind of your your romance novel LP, um, Strange Little Birds, which was really darkly personal. The music was very, a bit softer than usual. It was very kind of, it's not sad girl rock, which I do love. There was something just a little bit more ethereal about it and now we're back to hard wonderful raunchy what interests me is this all a lot of times you're speaking so personally and it's so great about you know your own existential dilemma and on this album you're kind of speaking about a larger power play for instance and also you're still keeping it to the existential crisis you have just as a sensitive human being yeah, I mean, I I feel like, much like every other artist and or human being, 
uh, the last sort of decade's been pretty intense, you know, and the last five in particular have felt like really overwhelming. I think with the sort of garnering of power and speed and information through social media, there's a lot going on between our ears, all of us, all the time, at a rate that I don't think human beings have ever asked, been asked to process in the history of the world, you know? So I think that's one of the reasons why this record's just taken this sort of weird leap as, as, as though it's come from nowhere in a funny way, but is speaking, I think, to how my brain is, is trying to cope with all this information. One minute. Somebody's really scratching a lot. It sounds like scratch, a scratch record. Is that you, Tim? So, I don't know. All right, change, change the cable. Right. Shirley and I will carry on. Just, just yeah, that's too annoying. Sounds like a chicken is in the background. Poor Tim, I'm embarrassing. Being called out in front of class. Well, Tim Dahl, he has many talents, and including finding another cable, so that's not a biggie. So were you recording this new album during the pandemic? Was this, you know, happening? Did it start before or during? How long did this take? And and it's out now. And what's great is you're releasing so many videos, as you always have, for the songs, which is fantastic. Videos have been really great and really diverse. Most of the writing was done pre-pandemic, almost entirely, which is really peculiar. You know, that the themes that we were touching on were themes that then became sort of global hot points um you know whilst we were all in lockdown all of a sudden we were all looking at these same themes that we had been discussing and continue to discuss on this new record of ours one minute simon we're still it sounds it sounds like somebody's eating potato chips simon uh i'm here i'm 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 not understanding why that's <laughs> i don't know happening. where that's happening uh, tim surely are you are you like scratching no, something I mean, she's I'm not, not moving she's you, you know, gesticulating with lips and fingers only Okay, are, are uh, Lydia? Are you I'm are not, you touching anything? Hey, if I was touching my pussy, it wouldn't sound like fucking potato chips, honey. It sound like <laughs> sound <laughs> like Lydia. sound like velvet. I think I know what I know what the issue yes. is. Shirley, is your microphone on your headphone wire? Yes. Yeah. So that's what it is. It's bouncing around, and that's when it hits the fabric of your shirt. It's it's sensitive enough. Oh, it's, it's I will hold it. No, so you, I, you can't take your shirt off. So. You, you could be shirtless, I could be pantless. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> you know what? We ain't perfect. We ain't doing that for no chump change. Forget about it. As a matter of fact, the audience, no, we don't want to see them naked either. I hate and we quote Bataille. Nudity is leaves the taste of the rat. <laughs> oh my god. That, that, that went somewhere I didn't So so the two of you have a connection as kind of slightly rebellious teenage oh, slightly. Uh, uh, girls. Now I was looking I, I know Lydia's stories and they're they're pretty wild and a lot of people know her stories, but you used to break into zoos. I I would have been known to break into Edinburgh Zoo with my bunch of my teen pals, yeah, when we were sniffing glue and <laughs> hiding from our parents and basically just being rebellious teenagers. What is the Edinburgh Zoo most renowned for? Well, it's changed a lot since I was a kid. What, they, what they is renowned have, for now? They've improved security. I hope they've improved security. <laughs> there wasn't really any security back then. I don't know, for the penguin walk and the pandas. And uh, I guess that's the two biggest, ah, does, biggest draws. But you're, you're fucked up, so it doesn't matter. Just have a good time. Tim, surely Tim often tells animal stories on the podcast, so that's why he's so interested I love in it. the zoo. So just saying. I love animal stories. So what about having like the Fringe Fest, I mean, as a kid and just the culture in the summer in Edinburgh, what was your relationship just growing up there? Did well, I mean, it's a huge festival, as you probably know, and, and it was great to be surrounded by that, to grow up with that every year, to have that annual celebration of art, basically. I have to confess, did have an impact on me. I was a member of Edinburgh Youth Theatre. So uh, I have won several fringe firsts with, with Edinburgh Youth Theatre and performed there regularly through my teens. And so I have nothing but amazing memories of it and memories of being on a float going up the high street of Edinburgh shouting, come and see our show! Oh, cool. as, as disgusting, precocious <laughs> teenagers do back then. I mean, you've acted recently. Yeah, I have. I mean, 
I, I don't even know if I acted in, in that TV show. <laughs> I think I was just sort of stumbling through like a like a deer in the headlights. Um, More I was really like a glorious diva, gorgeous and floating through somebody else's project. Well, I was cutting people's throats and, and destroying people. Uh, and it was amazing to play a Terminator. <laughs> it was exciting. Well, it's always better, as I say, to turn the knife outward than inward. And speaking of which, we're going back to some of your lyrics for a minute because you are a top lyric writer about, once more, especially the female existential crisis of being alive, of being in relationships, of having these you know, these things put upon you that nobody can live up to. And, you know, you express them in my documentary just about how horrifying, you know, bully, being bullied and the insecurity, but not even the insecurity. In the height of your success, which is still further coming, how horrible you felt because you had these misogynist idiots at record companies try to compare you to other female, you know, musicians as if, we're fucking sacks of potatoes. Well, I think unfortunately through the history of through the history <laughs> of, of the music industry, as long as the music industry has been in play, you know, women have been seen as sort of playthings, I think, because it's run dominantly by men. I mean, you've talked about this till you're blue in the face. Well, not about the music industry, just about the political industry, because I have avoided successfully the mainstream music industry. But what really horrified me is you're selling so many records. You're doing amazing. But hold on, hold on, Lydia, because that's an interesting point, because I don't think it's just in the mainstream music industry. I think it's dribbled all the way down to people like yourself, Daniel Dax, Cozy Fan, to the, I mean, all these really obstreperous women were... You, you weren't treated very well, well or very no, kindly either. Well, it's, look, I wasn't, they just didn't treat me at all, which was preferable. I mean, they saw the look <laughs> in my eye and avoided me. So I didn't, <laughs> I never had bad treatment. I mean, I had Michael Zilka understanding how you go from teenage Jesus to queen as I am. I didn't have anybody going, you can't do that. Cause I wouldn't, I wasn't involved in them. But to me, that's what's so phenomenal is, look, let's go back to the origins first. You didn't start out thinking that you're going to sell all these records and be a huge pop star, but you did. And it happened pretty quick with garbage and cunt. Congratulations. Who knew that would happen? And I mean, and that's what I want to ask you about fame. And it came pretty quick. How horrifying or how fantastic was it? Well, it didn't come quick for me because I was actually in another band before yes. Garbage. And we, we, made, we made numerous records, four records before I ever was successful with Garbage. So I'd been touring for a decade with that band. Um, and so it didn't feel like success came quickly to me at all. But when it did hit, I was pretty shaken by it because I'd been in this independent struggling band for a decade and I was used to people ignoring me. I was used to people not paying attention. I was used to people not writing about my band or what we were creating. And then all of a sudden I felt really self-conscious and I was you know, under the, under the lens of mainstream media and it was pretty intense. Yeah, exactly. How are you supposed to combat it? I mean, you're doing what you want to do. It becomes weirdly successful. You're used to it not being successful. And then there's the fucking lens. How, I mean, it's like you can't even enjoy what, what, what's happening, what you're doing, what you've actually succeeded as few others have done. Well, I definitely had some mental struggles with success for sure I wasn't the best equipped to deal with the, the amount of success we enjoyed but that said despite it being a challenge I still managed to keep my shit together you know right. and that's why I've had the kind of career that I've had exactly was and there was on. there with your previous band was it uh, goodbye Mr. McKenzie was there a divorce where you poached to join garbage like well, I was touring with Angelfish, oh, which okay. was the Sorry. interim band in between the okay. two. But it was essentially Goodbye, Mr. McKenzie, but it had, it had since morphed into Angelfish. And then we were on tour in North America and the band, the male members of, the, of Angelfish, all decided they were going to go home. And it just so happened that it coincided with me getting a phone call from Garbage to see if I wow. wanted to come up for an audition. Wow. 
but they but then the re really interesting thing is once I hit the sort of big time with garbage some of the male members of my or should I say one male member of my band and goodbye Mr McKenzie then went to the press and said that I had left them okay. for quote unquote which vigs big dollars Which <laughs> for what Wait, <laughs> or at least that's how it was reported say, say that press. again for what vig say that again for butch vigs big dollars oh yeah oh right okay. sorry sucker. So like you're a sellout yeah. you're they're implying you're some kind of sellout yeah. or something ridiculous yeah you have not ever sold out because what's miraculous to me about you is your lyrics are so dark and they're so personal and now they're, you know, branching out into more kind of political things. It's not as if anybody's going to really expect stupid girl. I'm only happy when it rains. All the other songs you've read to actually fluke somehow mysterious magically because they're so great to number one. You never sold out. I didn't. But, you know, that's how they chose to view well, it. Well, you, you know, know what? A lot of people like dismiss. It. <laughs> dismissed yes absolutely dismissed you know you are one of the weirdest <laughs> lyricist and we love you for that so anybody, <laughs> you know, I, I got two i got two big balls anybody wants to suck the left one i'll leave the right one for all the dismissers of you all i'm saying <laughs> thank you lydia lunch so charmingly put. Uh, i love it i'm such a gentleman <laughs> tim doll go ahead please i need to cool off I mean, are you guys still working? Is Butch still in Wisconsin or is everyone in Los Angeles now? Or do you have to, do you go back? Oh God, no, we, we, we sold our Butch sold that studio a long time oh, okay. ago. So Butch is in Los Angeles as I am and Steve. Um, and it's only Duke that remains back in, in Madison, Wisconsin. So it's, yeah, we're all, I guess, Southern California. Now. Oh, wow. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit, Shirley, about when you just, when, okay, it's time to make another record. So now you're, you, the seventh album is now out, no gods, no masters. So it's time to make a new record. How do you go about, I mean, do you come with lyrics in advance? Do you hear the music? Do you write the lyrics? I'm just thinking about my own process as well. Like what is kind of the process of just, you know, here's the songs, do you come with lyrics? Do you have a box of them under your bed? What's, what's, what's the method? <laughs> I wish I had a box of them. No, I have some lyrics in my computer and then most of it's made up on the spot. Once I get a sort of thread, sometimes I take like one quote or one line, something that's inspired me, and I build on that during the jamming sessions and just see whatever comes out, you know. So and you do often the melody will dictate the lyrics, and so you you kind of you have the ability to jam on the songs, which is great. But I understand it's that one line. If you don't have that one line, whatever it is, could be the first line, the middle line. It, you got to wait for that line yeah well it's always instructive I think you can live without the one line but it's certainly helpful if you've got like an idea even a direction in your mind you're sort of halfway there if you've got any intelligence whatsoever well we're not counting on anybody else to be in this conversation except <laughs> I think we're pretty damn fucking smart I love the song the creeps because I love <laughs> when I get like, first of all, I am a creep, but I'm usually, I'm not, so am I. I'm a creep to other people. I'm not, I'm never creeps to myself, but I love the line when I get like this, <laughs> I give myself the creeps. I long, <laughs> I long to give myself the creeps. I'm a fucking creep. I just give it to everybody else. I love that line. And also I'm going to recommend Carza, Carla Boslick, Evangelista. She has a song called The Creeps, which is very different and really fantastic as well. So interesting. I'm going to have to check that out. She's a big fan of hers. Oh, one of my favorite vocals. I think in fact, a bit of rock and roll uh, trivia. I think she may well have been in the running for the gig in garbage. Whoa. Whoa. In garbage. Whoa. Well, I mean, one of my favorite songs of all time is Dragon Lady by uh, the Geraldine Fibbers. Carla has sung on a, Carla has sung on a few of my albums. She's, she's a genius and she's amazing. And I'm sure she sends her love as any woman I told I was talking to my number one crush was like, send her my love. <laughs> All right, Aww. send her flowers. I don't know, dead ones. Send me flowers, God right, damn it. Send her a, she doesn't. Send me your broad panties, Lydia. Oh, well. Oh, it's honey. It's a little while now. All oh, right. Uh, no, God. no, I'm oh. sorry. I might be delivering them <laughs> to you in a couple of weeks. So you better watch Whoa. out. <laughs> Whoa. I'll be the creep uh, at the door with not where. I'll be the creep 
at the door. Special, we'll be the- <laughs> special <laughs> delivery. Oh, special delivery. Oh, my God. I love it, Should, I, I, love should it. I wear them until then? I think I will. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. Why not? Oh, old they're, school. They're old school. The creepier, Honey, the, the creepier, the better, right? Well, I'm afraid. I, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I fear you and I, it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter how long we wear our panties, they're still going to smell like lily of the valley. Ooh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's getting wild, ladies. I love it. So, uh, <laughs> any any insight on who else was in the running for the garbage position? Oh, I can't remember now, but I've got a feeling it may. I I can't remember well, now. There won. is a couple of them. I think they hope they hoped for PJ Harvey. Harvey oh. I don't think PJ was interested. I don't think she would have been appropriate. No, shy, but uh, I mean, <laughs> I landed where I was supposed to land. Like right. I really augment my band, and they really augment me. Amazing. They're really good. All right, and we're really lucky. Really? How that happened? Riddle me know. this, my wit. <laughs> James Bond theme song. I mean, did that? I mean, did that inflate? I wanted to say your your ass a little bit, but did that inf- like you're doing a James Bond theme song? How much? What more do you want in this fucking world? And it was great. I mean, did that? Did you, did you fly to the moon because this world was not enough? <laughs> I mean, it was pretty surreal. I must admit, you know, being Scottish, the Scot. I mean, the right. Bond franchise is huge right. anyway. But being Scottish, like we see it as ours, right? Because of Ian Fleming, and so it was a huge honor. And it happened to coincide with the same year that. Garbage were invited to open the Scottish Parliament, which we opened after 272 or three years. Can't remember the exact uh, n- number now, but um, it, I think I got the phone call about the Bond theme, and then the following day got the phone call inviting us to open Scottish Parliament celebrations, and it just felt like a rock and roll fantasy. I well, mean, I, I hope that made you happy for a few minutes there, sad girl, because it should have. Yeah, for a couple of minutes. I thought, yeah, for a couple then, of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you, Lydia. Back to reality. I'm not a sad girl. Yeah, indeed. I've done some sad girl music, but I, I, I'm pretty much the Joker. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do a remake of the Joker called The Choker. <laughs> Would, would you want Scotland to secede from the Union? As a Scot, I'm very proud of my country and my ancestry. I have to confess that be, sitting in the privilege of a travelling musician mm. where I get treated the same no matter where I go, I tend to not be a huge fan of nationalism. Of course. Of course. Yeah. But being that I don't currently live in Scotland, I don't really think it's any of my business ah. because I'm not there right now. So... I believe that the people will make the right decision. Okay. Well, I wish that I wish that people (laughs) in this country could make some right decisions. Some of them do, some of them don't. I would like to see the economics behind the decision to secede. England has been, you know, Brexit's a little bit of a thorn in the in the behind. So that's one reason why I'm bringing it up. And well, the Scots also vote very differently from the English. Yeah, exactly. Just historically. We have always leaned left and the English have mm. predominantly leaned right. And so there is a clash, totally. a philosophical clash between the Scots and the, and the English. So there's a problem there. But I always figure that you should work together to figure something out rather than just not. That's just my just how I see it. I'm not even gonna go into Lydia. I'm not even gonna go into a political rant as I did the other night. I'm gonna put that to the side for a minute and just put it to the side, Lydia. Put it to the side. Hey, I get paid for that shit. This is free for all of us. What I wanna know is all right, now you're about to undertake, after a while of not, another pretty big tour. How does that feel? And also, what is the best? People have no idea what it's like to tour for x amount eight, two weeks 10 weeks whatever people don't have any idea how either exhilarating or exhausting it can be so you're about to undertake this pretty massive tour are you excited to get out of the cocoon of the pandemic well it hasn't felt like a cocoon to me i feel like a racehorse in a stall like i'm kicking and fighting and ready to run i've been historically very uh well suited to touring i mean i've for, at the very sort of earlier parts of garbage history, we were touring for two years on the trot. Oh my God. Um, yeah, and that's intense and not everyone can do it. I'm lucky I can do it. I've missed one show in my entire career. 
yeah, it's insane. So I feel like I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. You know, I'm really good at touring. Mm. It's just, and it's really paid my career well. I don't think I've missed a show, but I once almost did vomit on Tim Dahl's head. But fortunately, there was a toilet and a shower right behind him. <laughs> yes, I was in so much right. agony. That was in that Germany. <laughs> It was in the middle of the show. I'm like, I have, it was in the middle of the show. I'll be right back. Yeah, I'll be right go, back. Yeah. Both yes. ends. I did that in Mexico City once. Like I, I was like, <laughs> oh, yes. oh, something doesn't feel good. Oh. I'll be right back. Last, well, last, I, last time I was in Mexico City, I had the same thing. I was like, oh, well, it's the last night. We're going to party. And all stuff. I was like, nope. Woo, no, uh, I'm not. Ha, ha, uh, not enough. Fun. <laughs> well, that night that I'm speaking about, I had to do it twice. I'm like, I'll be right back. Don't start without me. And uh, both ends burning is all I can say. <laughs> Yeah, um, both ends burning. I once had a really horrible both ends burning experience at the K Rock uh, Weenie Roast. Uh, uh, it was when Kiss, when the band Kiss were reforming. Like for the fifth, and fifth it was time, a big deal. I think for the yeah the, the last right, time right, that right. they reunited, and it was a, they were performing at K Rock Weenie Roast, and it was a huge big scene, and there was a ton of bands there. It was at the height of alt rock like power. And I was, I had both ends burning. And I said to Steve Marker and my band, uh, I'm really needing to go. And it was shortly before we went on stage. I said to Steve, I'm really needing to go, Steve. This is bad. And he went, okay, come with me. We'll go to the, we'll go to the, we'll go to the front of house instead of the backstage area oh. where all the bands yeah. are. We'll go to the like, Oh my are. God. Yes. And, and he took me to the portal there and there was a oh. huge queue and Steve just shouted, get out of the way, get out of the way, she needs to go. And, if you, and everybody yeah, sort of parted and, in horror. If, you didn't, this have, if like, you didn't have to go before you got to the porta potty, you're going to have to fucking go when you get there, probably vomiting. Oh, I, I, went, I was going, I, I went. It was, did anyone ask for your autograph when you left the porta potty? <laughs> no, but I, I was really sick and then had to start to get my shit together. And then we had to go and take photographs from oh the my, um... who you know, were backstage and they were looking all fresh and gorgeous. And with I, such I, good was, looking I was just hoping not to leave any noodles on Tim Dahl's head or his pedals. I succeeded in not. It happens. I saw the noodles though. I saw them backstage. Yeah, well, they weren't on your head. <laughs> Hey, both Good ends you, burning. Lydia. Hey, that was just, that was from pain. Both ends burning. No bra, no panties. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it's like, it's good, good thing I wasn't wearing any panties, otherwise they would have been soiled and somebody would have had to wash them. It wasn't going to be me, let's face that. <laughs> it would be terribly soiled. Well, I could oh. probably, <laughs> hey, I, I, I've i sold soiled panty hose before, but not soiled. That's <laughs> another oh, that's story. Right. Oh, that's, that's right. That's right. I forgot about that. That's oh, my God. sideline. Oh, my God. Well, look, hey, I'm not, I'm not doing arena gigs, honey. I have to have a sideline every now and then, all I'm saying. What do you do? When you're not on tour writing an album, how do you have fun? Or what do you read? What do you listen to? God, that's such a big question. I mean, during the pandemic, I started getting into this weird jazz kit because I'd always been repulsed by jazz. Ooh. And it was basically based on, I think, complete ignorance. And I started watching the Ken Burns documentary, which is phenomenal. If, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it to everyone and anyone. And it really gave me this great education on, on the meaning of jazz and the sound of jazz and the, the discipline of it. And I was so blown away and my mind was blown. I just couldn't understand how I'd been so stupid, you know, well, you and so know, ignorant. You, did, you, and did, so... you didn't know. And it's like, you know, it's like if, if, if you tell somebody if they don't know about music or pornography and you send them in a store and they know nothing, they might pick up a lot of stuff they don't know or don't like. And it's the same with jazz because there's so many different kinds. Yeah. And, you know, I've done, I've done jazz influence things or like what I'm doing with Sylvia Black now, but it's very, it's only influence. You would be, you would do an amazing jazz influence record. Now we're going to talk about that later. How do you enjoy yourself? I don't know. I don't really do very much. I have to say, like, I love watching movies. I love TV. I love walking the dog. I love to eat. I love music. Yeah, I love having baths. I love reading books. I mean, I don't, I love going to art galleries, but I, I don't really do much. I'm not cool like all these rock stars who do all these cool, sh all these cool things. I, I don't do anything. Hey, like you that. just busted me. I'll, I like to take baths. I like to binge watch Hannibal. I like to read some books. Uh, what's wrong with that? I like to flirt with people occasionally. <laughs> Brilliant. 
true. It's true. Uh, I love that though. I love that being described as a pastime. That's genius. Ah, uh, it's I, I'm unbearable. I I'm totally. I love it. Well, you know, I'm not going to ask you in your on your spare time. I like to flirt. Uh, no, well, the thing is, look, <laughs> I like to flirt when I'm walking down the street. For instance, any woman I see on the street, I'm always like, you're so beautiful today because it's better than hearing, hey, smile. Hey, yo, you married every woman I see on the street. There's two people I try to get smiles out of. Every woman I see on the street, I'm like, you're looking great today, honey. How you doing? Especially the male women. And then grandpas or grannies. I just want to give a smile to them. It's you get true. smiles that you get smiles out of cops. The, well, the most... I get tears out of cops. <laughs> oh, you do both, both. Yeah. Smiles and tears. I like to. It's bizarre, but I do like to even flirt with you know I like anybody that passes me. But I just want to give them something that nobody else gives them. But that's spreading a little happiness. Yes, I mean I figure that you know I have to cogitate and and you know, contemplate and then spew out what appears to be negative when really it's just the facts. So then in my spare time, I just like to flare with passing, you know, whatever. So, so how long is this next tour, the tour that's going to bring you back to the world? How long is it going to be? Uh, I don't know for sure, but we're touring all the way through to sort of the middle of November. We start on the 8th of august we, wow. we head out from la and then we don't come back until november so how many, how, many, the end of the year. how many shows a week on average do you do well go look on their website they're all listed. i'm curious i'm curious because as many you know, as you, possible well no because with vocal a lot of uh top 40 bands stuff they do four or five these days they actually it's true well when we're on our own tour we tour six days out of the week okay. sometimes sometimes more than that but generally speaking we do try and insist on a day off once a week but this is a tour with Alanis Morissette and Liz Fair and it's not our tour so we're not in charge and so Alanis and will and her team will dictate what the days are on and days off are and I don't know what they are how does she on. wait so how is she the mistress headmistress of the tour when 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 someone sells like Alanis sells yeah, when you yeah. sell 60 well, million records of your no. debut when it's the fastest selling debut of by any female artist you want to know in the right. history of the world i i, I want to know and well look she's making a comeback and again i mean alanis morris said still weird introverted yet extroverted she's coming from a sideways place and it's again it's it's another fluke you don't know why because by all means she's really an alt artist she's it's oh, not yeah, like without she's, a doubt. She didn't set out to be commercial. Somehow it it, flew, it hit a nerve somewhere, and it's. But yeah. you and I have talked about that before. That's what the '90s were: was all these indie alt artists just suddenly enjoyed the mainstream for the first time in the history of music, and it's never been seen of again. Like we've gone back to pop. Ruling well, which the is why I, why I had to cover that fantastic song low by cracker which i never heard anything by them except that song low look low do you want to go down like some junkie cosmonaut one of the best lines the top 40s so what can i say what i remember it? that oh i had to cover it but it was perverse because i did do a whole al cover album and uh i had to do that one because it's just so freaking weird so so you know you're getting into jazz now and you know, you grew up maybe as a rocker and, and other maybe popular art, uh, music forms. Have you gotten into classical? Were you into classical? Are, is there any avant-garde music that ex experimental music that you're really into, or what do you listen outside of your world and outside of jazz, if anything? Well, I certainly listened all my life to classical music. I was sort of, I wouldn't say I was classically trained because that's far too highbrow for what my musical background was, but. I sang in a choir, I played in a school orchestra, I was classically trained on the clarinet and, and the violin and the piano. Um, so I, I love classical music. Um, Where is and, the violin and, album coming? You know, I had an oh, It will never, ever, ever happen. The violin and I did not get on well. Me and the clarinet got on very well, as me and the piano did, but the violin and I disastrous well it sounds like it might be a good idea i had a band medusa's bed with a violin all female viol improv female viol uh, violin bass and uh, electronics occasionally i play guitar and saying i love the violin even ill played Woo. yeah i'm not sure you would love me playing the violin. Uh -huh. well you know 
Maybe look, I, hey, I can do wonders with garage man. You never know what I might make of it. Who knows? Well, indeed, me? that's absolutely true. I mean, you certainly could fanny around with it, I guess, and make it sound Did cool. Did you say but, fanny? You know, I'm not a great player. Fanny around with it? <laughs> fanny around with it. I yeah. never heard that term, but I'm not <laughs> gonna forget it, that's for sure. Fanny uh, it's a Scottish Scottishism, but and I also not- love opera. Like I I grew up really loving opera. I was always into the drama of that, so yeah, I love all kinds of music, to be quite honest. Well, there's plenty of time for you to explore all of those sub and other genres, and I cannot wait. What's interesting, so, so now this new album is a bit, obviously your last album was a bit more esoteric, a bit more, I don't want to say romantic, because it's really, you know, internal, a bit more esoteric, and now we're back. It's almost like some of it was almost like, I have to find this term that I called it because I just was very impressed with it. Anyway, come back to that. But now it's going more aggressive. So is your new set, is the set that you're doing is going to be quelled, you know, quelled from everything, mostly the new album, a variety of things. Do you change the set as you go on? Do you have a set set in the live show? All of the above, which I know sounds like a complete cop no, it doesn't. But it depends who we're it depends who we're playing for. You know, when we're playing for other people's audiences like Alanis or for Blondie, which we're doing in the fall, um, we tend to approach the set list differently than when we're putting our own set together. Because obviously, when it's your own audience, they know all the weird, obscure. You go to the deep cuts. Yeah, exactly. Yes, the, the deep cuts. They want the deep. <laughs> so it just depends on what we're doing. I am have old a- fashioned though, like I am not cool like so many artists who just want to do what they want. Like to me, I'm there in service of the audience. That's just how I view it. And, and not very many people sort of seem to adhere to that anymore. Well, maybe that's I, why like, you've got I such a big audience. <laughs> serve them. Maybe so that's maybe. why. <laughs> but I want to, I am in service. I want to be serving. Uh, well, I want to be I, servile. We can talk about that later, Shirley. No biggie. <laughs> That's what I was with. <laughs> that's what I, I jumped right into that's that. That's what I was. Oh, honey, I just want to hear you laugh. I love it. So the, I have a question. It's just a business thing. So you know, some people like to do be cool and do their deep cuts, and they're gonna maybe be contrary and not play all their hits. Are there contracts with some of these giant promoters, whether it's uh, I don't know, Clear Channel, I, I don't know, or Live Nation, wherever, where they say, well, you have to play X amount of of your hits like at least 10 percent. is that is that on the table that has never never happened to us i mean they obviously dictate the amount of time you have a minimum you know this yeah, yeah you of do course, it, yeah. you have to do a minimum sort of set time but beyond that no nobody i don't think we'd ever have to go and, and then of course and of course if you go over time because i know like uh like msg is like a hundred thousand dollars an hour so like that's why a lot of times you won't see uh encores there because they're like Oh, it's, and it's right. It's not prorated. It's right on the on the minute there. And then the plugs get pulled a lot of the time. You know, it's just poof, you're off, you're out. Yeah, the plugs might get pulled, and then you put the butt plug in the promoter and you <laughs> take them down for more money. All I'm well, gonna- you could always try that approach, I guess, Lydia. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I don't want to go near a promoter's I'm, ass, I'm, quite frankly. I'm, so, I'm sorry to say <laughs> they hear me coming, and they just put it in themselves. They just realize. <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna be easier that way. Um, Indeed. <laughs> Shirley, do you have any, <laughs> are any of your songs, you know, it's weird how people f- have favorite songs, right? Or they have a favorite album. And a lot of times it's whenever in their life they heard that song or they heard that album that it impacted them the most. But do you have a favorite song of your own? I mean, I love all my songs, but you know, they're all bastard children. Is there any song that you really go, I, I, I'm in it when I'm doing it. And this is like the most, that this is like the most me. This is the most valid to my existence. I know it's a stumper. Well, again, that's, that's changed over the years, you know, cause I feel like I've changed since the beginning of the band, the band's career. We'll say um, now, we'll say now. So we'll now say. it would be, a, it, it would probably, I mean, I find myself really represented well by a song that we we put out uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and we included it in the new record. It's called No Horses, and it's basically about the destruction of capitalism, of everything beautiful that can't or or is incapable of generating money. 
and uh, and that feels to me like a very important point to make that at some point we have to cease valuing everything on by you know current capital by, yeah yeah by capital. a lot a lot of your lyrics are very personal and are there any that actually make you feel like you're you know presenting in in every album quite a bit of vulnerability just by exposing, you know, the horror, I'm going back to this again, the trauma of one's own personal existence, whether it's just from, you know, the cancer of birth, the trauma of bullies and bad relationships, feeling insecure, all of that stuff. Are there any songs that actually, when you're doing, you feel vulnerable? I think there are three songs that leap to mind. One would be Waiting for God, which touches on the, on, on systemic racism on the new record, which I've, I can barely listen to it. It bothers me still. Um, there's a song we have called Bleed Like Me, which is essentially about all the things that we do to destroy ourselves when we're in pain. And then finally, there's a song called Silence is Golden off our third record, which is dealing with um, child abuse. And it's not uh, from, a, from a biographical stamp, autobiographical standpoint. Um, it's a biographical story about someone who I love and it was written for them. Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, we record, so not every song we record has to also be done live because sometimes, I mean, I'm just thinking in my own immediate history with retrovirus and it's weird because nobody might notice this, but there is one song written when I was 20 and Tim and I are kind of the main components, but you know, Weasel Walter is an incredible guitar solo at it. And I really, I call it sad. It is sad girl, but it is also kind of big band. And nobody really knows that it's written from kind of a six-year-old girl's perspective. They just wouldn't know it from the way it's presented. And it's very emotional to me. And nobody would really realize that unless they really dug in or really knew and really listened to the lyrics. So, and I, I can't say I felt that way with any other song, but at least there's one song I feel that, but it's mandatory to do it, to do it live because it's just part of what we do right now. So yeah, people have- Yeah, it's funny. I mean, when you, when you talk about sad girl music, to me, being a sad girl is transgressive. You know, I feel like at least my generation and probably yours too, we grew up being told that every woman's worth was in how pleasing she was. And to me, I wanted to be the sullen girl who wasn't smiling, who wasn't pleasing people. That felt like rebellion to me at a time in society that wasn't so friendly to women as it, as it is now. Now, it's still not great for women, but it's certainly better than it was when I was growing up in the 70s in Scotland. I always think that when somebody on the sidewalk says, why don't you smile, that a woman should reply, why don't I shit on your forehead? <laughs> I must remember that because that's a fucking genius. <laughs> and they might now, never. That needs to be taught. That they... needs to be on the national curriculum. Honey, I say it all the time. That's why, what can I say? Put it on a fucking t shirt. Why don't I yeah. smile? Put it on a t shirt. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to shit so on So good. You. Exactly. All of it. So good. I'm so happy you're hitting the road because right now, especially. Strong women need to be out there ranting, raving, raging, and having a good goddamn time. You know, representation, as we've been saying for years, is so important. And for artists who've been around for as long as, as you have, and myself, I think it's an important message to, to, to uh, signal to, to all people, not just women, but of any gender at all, that you can have a life, a creative life, and uh, beyond your 25th birthday or your 30th birthday or your 40th or your 50th. And it's an important message for all artists, I think, and just all human beings. And I'm very grateful for your courage and all the things that you've taught me in my, in my lifetime, even though you're probably completely unaware that you were influencing people like me back in Scotland, you know, in a, in, in a small city of Edinburgh, you told um, me about those uh, you, evenings with Chris Connolly and you and Ani. Uh, exactly, exactly. I love and it. It was it was thrilling and part of my musical education. And I'm I, I'm very grateful to you as someone who's operated on the fringes of 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 the music business and yet had such a big impact on so many artists. And we all look at you and and are 
grateful to you for your courage. So I'm sending you so much love and it's a big honor for me to be here today. And I say it with sincerity. Thank you so much about saying that, Shirley, because, and also what you, what you hit upon too is, it's not only me, but what you were saying is, so many artists, yes, have lived decades into their career. And often people who say, oh, I don't know, nothing's hitting me now. Well, you have to sometimes go back in time because people like Miles Davis or Louis Armstrong or a lot of jazz people, even rock people, I mean, they just kept going because we are relentless. We are not going to be stopped no matter how popular or unpopular we are, no matter what we have to do, it burns in our blood. It's what we are here to do. And the audience, no matter how small or how great is important because the people that find you or come to you are the ones that need to hear and relate to what you do. And that's why I keep going. I'm not stopping. You're not stopping. Tim's not stopping. Nobody's stopping because it's the goddamn Liddy. <laughs> <laughs> with Tim Doll, Lydia thank you Lund, so much and you Shirley pictures. I will talk to you soon I'm emailing yes you, you will have some chicken right. for me baby I bye. will darling I'll Enjoy think your of dinner. you as I'm munching down <laughs> bye guys I love you thank you bye. so much thank bye. you Tim it's lovely to meet you likewise <laughs>